Good morning to all of you. Today, uh, we are pursuing a more culture sensitive approach to um, media literacy. Uh, today's media, uh, today's uh, webinar has the title Media Literacy and Marginalized Groups. And our aim is to focus on vulnerable groups in society in general. Uh, we want to ask that if there are persons in the risk of becoming isolated, disintegrated, marginalized, in mi minority, uh, how could we, with the help of media literacy, contribute to increased uh, uh, integration, incre increased empowerment? Uh, can strengthening of media literacy competencies make people stronger, more involved, more engaged in society? We will dedicate attention to young people and their parents with immigrant background in the context of Norway, where there have actually been lots of research going on in this topic field lately. My name is Marit Jaakkola and I'm working as the co-director at Nordicom, uh, a center uh, of Nordic media research at the University of Gothenburg in Sweden. And I will be your host today. Um, our two previous lectures uh, in this series on media and information literacy, MIL, uh, discussed uh, first aging and media literacy, focusing on older people with the case of Finland, and then second digitalization and preschool children dealing with issues uh, of digital technologies and parenting with examples from Denmark. Uh, the idea of this webinar series is to take a look at MIL uh, and related research, uh, first in the Nordic countries and then beyond. Uh, this webinar will end the Nordic series, uh, but the webinars will be continued, no worry, with monthly sessions in November, and this series will be continued to June 2021. As always, we have created a web page on Nord Media Network for today's webinar, and it contains some showcase videos uh, showing best practices from Norway. Uh, there is Spilverket, a digital game developer studio for young people who find themselves outside education and employment. There are also two cases focusing on young adults with migrant background. So please take a look at these great videos after the webinar on your own hand. And there are also some uh, other useful resources for further reading, such as links, academic lit literature, and even today's slides can be downloaded there. Today's speaker is Carol Asungi Dralega, an associate professor at the NLA University College in Kristiansand, Norway. She teaches uh, master's courses in global journalism and has a PhD in media studies from the University of Oslo. Her research interests deal with the inclusion of marginal communities and groups such as women, youth and immigrants. And in a number of research initiatives, she has conducted research on video games. So with the focus on immigrant youth in Norway and their video game habits. In this, uh, she has been interested in understanding how young people use video games to navigate and construct often intersecting identities such as gender, religion, age, ethnicity, location and diasporic experiences in their everyday lives. Um, she has also been interested in models of video game regulation within family contexts. So as we may hear, today's topic resonates well with both previous lectures where inclusion and protection have been prominent issues and now combining both aspects somehow. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, you can leave them in the chat box uh, or ask in video after Carol's talk. We, be, we will have about 45 minutes time, about half an hour for the lecture. So Carol, now we are eager to hear what you have to say. 
warmly welcome. The screen is yours. Thank you, Marit. Good morning, everyone. Um, that was a beautiful introduction, Marit. Uh, I would like to start by thanking you for this invitation to present uh, this project or paper um, to the web webinar semi, uh, set series. So um, they are quite enlightening. In fact, I learned quite a lot from Kaivi's and Stina's presentations earlier. And I like the fact that uh, the webinars, you know, bring researchers together to share experiences and also a, a space where we can find resources, as you mentioned. So um, today, my presentation um, uh, will be on video game, video gaming uh, regulation in immigrant family contexts in Norway and uh, meeting parents' informational needs and competencies. So the presentation falls within the realm of informal uh, media education. And the focus of course is uh, uh, out of school and marginalized groups like Marit says, specifically non-Western immigrants. Um, and the focus is also uh, on video games and their regulation in family contexts. So here, of course, video games are perceived as media artifacts that have increasingly over the years evolved from the margins uh, to the mainstream, of course, bringing along a lot of challenges, uh, especially when it comes to regulating them in the home. So I must admit, uh, I'm new to the scholarship on video games. I started in 2017 and more, uh, and also media literacy so discourses. Um, uh, so I will be cautious, but mainly I would uh, take the opportunity to focus more on the, um, on the studies or the, the, and share insights from the studies that I've particularly engaged in. So here I hope to extract media literacy discourses pertaining to, to, to this target group and look at, for instance, what is unique or not unique about their experiences with media literacy, what are their challenges, what are their needs, and most importantly, what approaches we as researchers have contributed to promoting media literacy within these groups. So in the next slide, um, I'm, I'm sure that many of you are, are quite interested in media literacy initiatives uh, in Norway. And I'm so glad that uh, Marit has put up quite a number of both research and research uh, projects and, research, uh, and studies that people can access. There's quite a lot that is going on in this field. And here we have just a few interesting ones uh, that I think that many of you will find useful and can revisit um, later on. So since I'm not dwelling too much on these, I would like to move on to the next slide in which uh, I briefly you know, speak about the research uh, going on in terms of uh, video games. Uh, Media Tilsine, which is the Norwegian media authority, does quite a lot of research. Um, it commissions research nationally and quite frequently. And in the most recent um, book, uh, it's a survey covering about, about 3,400 respondents, youth between 19 and 18, who also happen to be within my target group of interests in my research across the country. So the research shows quite a high number of youth already uh, playing video games in the country. And as... Um, as we can guess, the boys play more than the girls. Uh, 
at a rate of 96% of the boys and 76 of girls. And while the number has been stable, for instance, from 2018, the number of girls, interestingly, is increasing. Um, and also, uh, this report talks about, uh, shares quite interesting tendencies and patterns of media use uh, and uh, elements that could be interesting for media literacy scholars, like uh, sp spending money on video games. So quite a lot of the, the youths in this target group spend quite some money. Um, either they purchase um, things in the games by themselves, and sometimes they use the help of their parents. So there are quite interesting statistics there about video games. And EU Kids Online is another um, study uh, that has interesting statistics from 19 countries, including Norway, on, on all sorts of media use by youths um, and children, including video games and some information about immigrants. And um, yeah, so I list some of these um, studies uh, here, but also we'll have some of them on the, on the uh, web page. So on the next um, next page, we I, I continue to explore uh, to look at how um, uh, youths perceive or understand uh, video games. What do they gain out of the video games? And according to this most recent research by the media authority in Norway, uh, learning English was ranked among the highest benefits from media games, what they learned most. And we have to remember this is more of a general study, uh, not specifying um, you know, groups and demographies like much, uh, immigrants. And then socialization, learning generally. Um, yeah, uh, are some of the key issues or benefits uh, the youths obtain from video games. But as we know, uh, video games do much more than these um, uh, issues that are named here. And uh, for instance, according to the United Nations, uh, UNESCO's um, uh, program uh, promoting games for peace. Uh, video games uh, contribute to critical thinking, problem solving, empathy, and so on. So we, we have lots of games that, for instance, uh, contribute to, to conflict resolution that help refugees like Salam, uh, which was developed by a refugee from, from Sudan. Um, so video games do quite a lot. And in this um, UNESCO uh, initiative, uh, uh, which is under the Mahatma Gandhi Institute for Education for Peace, uh, the argument is that video games contribute to social emotional learning and in various ways, for instance, through understanding and managing emotions, which, which is self-awareness. Uh, another example is setting and achieving positive goals through games, and this is self-management. And then showing sympathy for others, social awareness, or building and maintaining positive relationship, which is relationship building or decision-making simply by making responsible decisions throughout the game. As we know, most of these games are quite strategic and collaborative and you know, um, problem-solving oriented. So um, the debates about video gaming have really been um, uh, focused originally on violence you know, the concerns, especially by parents 
on the the choices, especially with the boys, who 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 love to play violent games. So of course the arguments range from from being um, afflicting uh, psychologically to 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 the other side, which is not quite um, accepting of the fact that it affects the the users negatively. But of course, we've had discussions uh, on addiction, uh, which I think is a discourse quite evident in policies and much, much of the research is about addiction and particularly um, uh, gay, uh, what do they call it? money, uh, gambling, gambling related uh, gaming. Uh, the discussions have also moved towards, uh, more recently, towards time use as one of the biggest causes of conflict within the homes. And here, of course, Media Till CNA has, um, has presented interesting research, both on the youth's perspectives, but also parents' perspectives. But here, of course, the, the information is, is general. It does not um, target specifically uh, immigrants. Uh, more recently, the focus has been more towards media literacy and an interesting project that is ongoing uh, from Oslo Met uh, by Henry Mines uh, explores consumer literacies of teenagers in virtual gaming. And he looks at some of the key issues in uh, critical digital media literacy, which I think is quite interesting and can be followed. But generally the, the research is general in Norway. It's general, it's not a demographic specific to this target group. And um, on, on this basis, uh, it enabled uh, this research that we have undertaken over the last three to four years. So on the next page, um, I would like to say something about digital media competence among parents. And there is this interesting study from 2014 that explored the, the the media literacy among uh, especially adults in Norway. And, uh, and the results are quite interesting um, in the sense that it just shows that the immigrants are less competent digitally uh, compared to their no ethnic Norwegian counterparts. As the statistics show, 41% of immigrants uh, versus 21% Norwegians master technologies to, you know, to a, a small extent. Um, the study also shows that there are variations in terms of nationality where the immigrant comes from uh, in relation to technological efficiency. And the study shows how uh, eight out of 10 Polish uh, informants were really good at technologies. And these numbers varied quite uh, dramatically when it came to the, the, the people from different nationalities like Somalia, Iraq, Vietnam, and so on. So the study also tells about immigrants being quite good at using the older version technologies, uh, mainly for transnational communication with homeland, for, with, with uh, just to keep contact with the, with the people in the countries of origin. But they were quite motivated, uh, although they, they reported that there were lack of um, arenas where they could, um, they could learn more about uh, how to use these technologies. So uh, in terms of national policies, there are quite a lot. It's quite impressive how the Norwegians have, um, have incorporated both the digital uh, uh, changes in uh, caused uh, changes in digital communication, but also media literacy and competence. 
and through various policy frameworks, you can find these uh, out there. And three interesting ones, for instance, are digitization strategy for basic education. And this one targets uh, pupils, school going kids, youths, uh, and also teachers. And there's a lot on media literacy, online safety, and a lot of important uh, um, themes relating to media literacy. Uh, the white paper, this number 17 on an information society for all uh, offers an inclusive framework uh, that uh, that promotes um, all to be included in digital activities and so on, regardless of age, geography, gender, ethnicity, and so on. So um, I, find, I find that quite interesting. And then we, we have the introduction program. And this is specifically targeted at um, immigrants, especially refugees between 18 and 55 years of, of age. And it's aimed to, to help them get to work faster. They offer language courses. Um, societal lessons about the system, the, uh, the Norwegian culture and society, but also access to digital technologies. Some, uh, these are implemented at municipality level and in some municipalities, they offer training in the use of um, digital technologies which I think is quite interesting. But there's quite a lot and it can, you can follow this link after to see what lies there. So in the next chapter, uh, what is interesting for me in this presentation is the policy framework on, on games. Uh, it's the action plan against gaming problems, 2019 to 21. Uh, I'm glad to have contributed some insights, uh, especially regarding immigrant target groups. So this policy framework um, focuses on three main things, that as few as possible uh, people should be afflicted by video game or, or gaming problems. And uh, the policy framework calls for increase in knowledge production and dissemination, but also the preventive uh, element is quite important. And, and because of these, um, these funds uh, that are usually allocated to, to meeting these, uh, these needs, I also think that this policy framework offers very relevant um, and good information about the gaming problematic um, in relation to media literacy, um, like commercialization, for instance, and the thin line, the blurred line that many users, both youths and parents, encounter uh, during playing, the use of money and so on, which is a big challenge even for immigrant families. But what does the action plan in the next uh, uh, slide, what does this action plan say about minorities um, is, is something of interest because they specifically mention that uh, particular groups are outside, uh, uh, it are uh, excluded in previous uh, legislation and and initiatives. So they point to the fact that there is a need to 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 increase knowledge and to also create culturally sensitive um, initiatives to meet the needs uh, and capacities of these um, of these groups, which was something useful for my projects that I'm related, I, I work with. So uh, moving on, the Norwegian Media Authority has used the this uh, handlings plan, uh, the action plan to, to, to fund 
to offer earmarked funding for video game research, especially among non-Western immigrants. And it's here that I encountered um, this call for um, proposals with a focus on boys. Um, if you can move on to the next slide. <coughs> and move on. <laughs> so this was in 2017. And the, the, the aim was to explore um, media, uh, video game habits among non-Western immigrants. And it arose from a gap in research uh, and also a need to, to learn more about how identities are constructed. What are the issues that emerge uh, when immigrants considered as the other um, when they encounter video games. So we attempted to look at this from an intersectional perspective, but I think I'll go back to this later. So um, in the following year, yeah, if you can go back, I just want to say that the first project targeted youths and their media habits. The second project uh, targeted um, uh, youths in family contexts. And uh, the following two projects look at needs, the specific needs. So it's a chronolog chronological development uh, in the understanding of the needs of, of youth, just as a background for, for the projects that I'd really like to share. So uh, starting with the first one on the next, on the next slide, um, here we were interested in understanding the patterns of use, identity discourses, and regulation, particularly from the immigrants, uh, the youth's point of view. So, um, so we 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 included intersectional perspectives. Um, like Marit mentioned earlier, how they are uh, negotiated uh, through and in video games like ethnicity, religion, location, social cultural status, and so on and so forth. And in the next uh, slide, uh, this was a rather small qualitative uh, investigation with just 10 youths, which we endeavor to have both girls and boys. Uh, between 16 and 19, and from seven uh, non-Western countries. Um, they had lived in Norway between 2004 and 16, and uh, we had interviews with them. But since this was our, like my first encounter, I, I um, included uh, non-participatory observation so I could try to understand uh, what they go through when they navigate uh, video games. So in the next slide, uh, and here I'm rushing, is um, the, the, the findings were quite interesting. Uh, some unique, but others not quite unique uh, from the general um, research. So non-Western youth are part of a of the global gaming culture, uh, partly because uh, of the ubiquitous technologies, the technologies everywhere, thanks to the policies and initiatives for universal <laughs> service. And um, time use, as in other research, turned out to be one of the biggest challenges. But yet again, uh, there is, it's important to di distinguish between big gamers and problem gamers. Most of the, the target groups here were big gamers in that, in the sense that they played quite a lot, they used a lot of time, but this did not affect their, uh, seriously affect other important aspects of their lives like school, family life, their health and so on and so forth. So boys obviously played more than girls. Um, something common in the dominant discourses on video games. Uh, they played mostly with close friends 
we uh, uh, ethnic who happen to be mostly ethnic Norwegians, but uh, also they played with diasporic friends from their countries that had um, traveled to live in other parts of the world. And of course, in terms of language, we found that Noshk was the most used language in video gaming. Uh, and of course, then English, but they also used uh, their own native languages. Moving on. So in terms of identity, for the youth, the avatar skills, the skill sets were more important than ethnicity or religion or gender, first and foremost. Um, also, we, we, we witnessed how culturally inclusive um, video games could be, particularly for boys, you know, in the sense that they were playing so much with their friends who were boys. Uh, uh, and then uh, after playing, they would also go out and participate in other not game-related extracurricular activities. But these were excluding to girls uh, in the sense that the boys never played with the girls and the girls experienced exclusion and being blocked from playing simply because it was considered a an, an not um, girly activity. So it's both inclusive, including and excluding um, in this case. And then moving on, we also see some youths, you know, expressing their identities, um, experimenting with different identities and self-expression, self-representation. Um, they were able to speak not just Norwegian and English, but also continue to practice um, their own native languages. Uh, and for one, for one of them, it was important not to forget their native language. So, so using video games and speaking their own languages was a, a good thing for them. So in the next slide, um, of course, we see critical and some uncritical reflections by the youth. An example of um, uh, a critical insight is from a, a, a female informant who, who, say, who mentions the sexism in video games. Uh, this was interesting for, for a, it was a 16 year old. And for a boy who, say, who just mentions that, no, I never game with girls because girls don't play. And as we saw from the research earlier, that is that girls do actually play and the numbers are increasing. And in terms of um, representation within the games, you know, another female says she likes playing Chelsea, the, the English football team on FIFA but the, the avatars are white and male. So she has to be a, a white male to play in that game. So issues of representation in the games is also picked up um, by the um, informants. So in the next slide, there's quite a lot of uh, output, research output we have um, published that can be reviewed afterwards. But uh, if we can move forward, uh, I would like to say that the previous research had some gaps. And one of them was that um, we didn't get quite good uh, responses on regulation because the, the, the youth just uh, brushed it off or something. <laughs> so we decided that in the next research, we should investigate this in, in, um, in, in line with conflict and in family perspectives. So we brought together youth um, and their families and we, have, we had these conversations which turned out to be quite interesting. So the outcome of that was models of um, video game regulation, which I can go through quite uh, briefly uh, here. 
So um, in the next slide, uh, the experiences from this second project, uh, conflict and resolution in family contexts, we see that time use once again comes up um, as a big source of conflict uh, uh, in most of the families, nine out of 10 families. Um, and other issues related to unfulfilled family chores, time spent with family, homework, violence, and so on. <clears throat> but even with the families that didn't have conflict, there were still concerns about time use. So uh, the models we try to categorize in the next slide, uh, we come up with four models. And uh, the first one, um, the dictatorial parents, which we also refer to as the helicopter parents who are sort of up here, uh, top, using top down, very heavy handed approaches towards regulation. Um, and they sort of draw on their own upbringing uh, and try to apply this within um, their children's uh, video game. Uh, habits. So here, of course, then we see tensions between non-Western upbringing and Norwegian con contexts. And of course, then the Norwegian youth becomes more related, if I can use that word, to the Norwegian um, context as opposed to their own parents' uh, context. And um, Yes, here there, there is no negotiation. They are quite dictatorial. And in the next uh, model, uh, we see a dualistic uh, approach in which parents kind of invite negotiation, but ultimately take the last, uh, they, they have the last word. So there is conflict and unhappiness among the, the youths who do not feel heard. Um, and we've seen aggressive behavior coming out of this because the kids don't have an outlet, although they have a false sense that they do. And in the next uh, module, there were youths who are left on their own accord and they would self-regulate. Um, this fell mostly on girls because they were kind of smarter in, in deciding time limits. Um, yeah. And there's quite some openness and trust involved in this kind of model that allowed the youth to, to, to regulate. So the last model is a dialogical model and participatory. Um, many of the families that ended up here uh, had tried different models, conflict and so on. And and the parents, the tendency is that parents took the initiative to learn about video games and they took the initiative to, to participate in video uh, playing with their youths. So as a result, it, uh, there was some harmony within the homes and this, this then was considered one of the best practices and it's one of the modules that are being propagated by, for instance, the Norwegian Media Authority through their campaign, uh, Snack on Spill, speaking about, speak about games with the kids. So, Carol, winding Carol, up I'm, this- I'm sorry, yes. um, we are running out of time, so I guess we should rush on to the conclusions. Yes, yes. yes. I'll do that. Um, yes. So, the final project, uh, this project led us to, you can go right to the conclusion, actually. Um, so that project uh, led us to, to the need for resources. We realized that the, the parents really, really needed diversity of resources, which we ended up producing uh, brochures, videos, cartoons, and uh, booklets for these, um, for the different target groups. So we realize in reflection that policies exist, practices, research, and so on does exist, but it's quite general and does not 
target immigrant uh, uh, youths and parents. Um, and they have challenges that are specific to them, like some of them are illiterate and so on. So there is therefore need for a needs-based user-focused approach, processes and outcomes targeting this particular group, which is something that we have tried to achieve. Thank you. Thank you, Carol, very much. Um, an interesting presentation. And um, we will uh, upload the slides on the on the site so you can you can take a look at those slides that were not sh shown here right now. And of course, if you have any questions uh, afterwards, you can always email Carol personally. Yes. Thank you. Um, then it's time for questions. Um, and uh, I think um, uh, I. We, we have now heard, heard about the challenges that immigrant parents, but also uh, majority parents actually face, especially in relation to regulating video games, um, but uh, especially about the, the, the immigrant parents' uh, challenges. Was there anything you would um, consider a triumph or a positive experience to learn uh, from, something that also other parents could benefit from? Thank you. Um, the fact that there were no problem gamers and rather big gamers, uh, I think indicates that um, it's not too bad and they are doing something right. And I just need to uh, repeat the fact that there were more women than men uh, among the parents who showed up. Uh, altogether, I think we had 16 parents and only two were fathers. So it shows that parents were engaged, uh, they were in it uh, to win it, and uh, particularly the resilience uh, that they showed, um, especially for single mothers, for instance, who had so many kids, like one had nine kids and as a single mother, but she was sort of holding on and being engaged and so on and so forth. But ultimately the approaches that uh, that employed dialogue, I think were the winning, the parents who used dialogue were the winning, um, winning uh, parents, if I must say, in this um, challenge. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you. Um, then um, there is a question in the chat box um, uh, posed by Kaisa Saarenma from Statistics Finland, which is a very relevant question I would like to take up. Um, in different countries, um, do you have, do you have, what about in Norway, if we just focus on Norway, have you specific statistics or survey results on media contents consumed by different immigrant groups or language minorities. You showed some examples of some surveys, um, some, some studies uh, conducted, but how about um, monitoring uh, the media uses mm. of different immigrant groups or language minorities? I think that many um, uh, countries are struggling a bit with, with this uh, kinds of statistics, for example, in Sweden, we are not recording the language or officially recording the language of a person. Mm. Uh, so there it's uh, not possible to to retrieve such uh, information. But what about in Norway? Um, uh, IMD is the Directorate for Migration uh, and Diversity, IMD. It has quite a lot of studies uh, there, especially rega in regards to media use by immigrants. Um, and I think that they, they could have something, but I do not think that they have uh, information on video games. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, the biggest challenge for us has been the lack of uh, the gap in information uh, on immigrants. And it's changing because, um, like I said, the, the media authority in Norway has put aside funds for over the last few years to sort of build up this knowledge gap. 
So I think it's promising. But um, uh, yes, I think a, a slide that we may have skipped is about uh, media competence among immigrants by Vox. It's, it's on this one of these slides that has quite interesting uh, information about both access and so on and so forth. Okay, thank you. Um, do you have any questions? What about our audience? You would like to ask Carol? You can just turn on your microphone and shout. Please. Mm. I have been thinking, um, well, my question again um, about um, uh, immigrants and, and mill, uh, is there a possibility that we defined and when we define and study mill by majority norms that we miss some marginal characteristics or the uniqueness of, of, of the, the immigrant or diasporic mill? So um, the same goes maybe for studying mill in Western or non-Western context that uh, we may not always be able to identify all competencies with the same centralized pattern or thinking or structure, mm -hmm. but we should instead develop the pattern from within the community in question. Have you encountered any th these kind of things that uh, the, the concept of mill in, ma in the ma majority is somewhat how different from the concept and needs mill needs in, in the minority groups? Mm. Um, there is uh, quite, um, quite a number of needs that, that are universal, that, that are for both um, minorities and the majorities. Like the need to be critical, the need to know about important issues um, in this ever evolving media technologies, um, that's universal. And I, and I think that the Norwegian um, related uh, authorities or research has tried to do that, offering that general information like the Norwegian media authority has a lot. It has a campaign for, for particularly for, for families, like informal uh, uh, perspectives on how to deal with, um, how to offering a meal, you know, critical media literacy to parents from advising parents to offering discussion points for families to take up to adverts uh, on, on video games and, uh, commercialization, privacy, and all of that, it's there. But then the, the, the gap then comes because the migrants, especially the newer ones, they do not understand the system. They, it's not an easy transition into this bountiful knowledge. Um, uh, there is a gap with language. Most of the resources are in Norwegian, which most of the immigrants have to learn and it takes quite a bit of time. And in the meantime, the youth, uh, uh, it's easy for them to, to play video games and you know, uh, to encounter these challenges while the parents, it's a bit harder to get this information and get engaged. So issues of language, uh, cultural challenges like um, social control, for instance, in one case, a parent uh, uh, refusing to go out to seek help in for fear of being judged negatively by her peers and being looked at as a bad parent. So, so then it becomes a taboo uh, based on her um, cultural experience. So yeah, there are some particular uh, challenges and illiterate parents, you know, who can't read and write. And that's why we have like videos that someone can listen to or cartoons in, we have resources in five languages that uh, the different target groups can reach. And this is not an issue for the majorities. Exactly. Yeah, that was uh, relevant. 
But now it's time to thank you, Carol. Thank you so much for your presentation. And uh, now it's also time to end the webinar. So th thank you for everyone who listened. And this was, as I said, uh, the last one of our webinar series of three talks addressing the Nordic countries. Uh, and this was a collaboration between Nordicom and the Swedish Media Council. But this is not the end. You will have to uh, ha have a chance uh, to learn more in November uh, when Nordicom will launch um, the European series in collaboration with the Media and Learning Association. You can find information on Nord Media Network's website. We hope that you have enjoyed the, the talks so far. Uh, please write about your ideas and thoughts to us and uh, we'll stay connected. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.